You're listening to BioTalk with Rich Bendis, the only podcast focused on the biohealth capital region. Each episode, we'll talk to leaders in the industry to break down the biggest topics happening today in biohealth. Hi, this is Rich Bendis. I'm your host of BioTalk. We're back after the Labor Day holiday and all ready to go back to work again. And we're doing something unique, and that is really having two people on our podcast this time for the first time. And we have two very interesting individuals who are going to talk about their company as well as a great event that's coming up in the near future. We have Zan Fleming, who is the executive chairman of Connexum. We also have Thomas Sa, who is the president and CEO of Connexum, both with us today on BioTalk. Zan and Thomas, welcome to the show. Well, Richard, thank you very much. We are delighted to be here. I go back a good ways to living here in Montgomery County, came up here from Nashville to be at NIH in the early 80s, lived in Chevy Chase for many years, and have moved out a little further up the Potomac River. But essentially, I gravitate to this area, and it's been a great place to raise a family and to develop a business. I'm an endocrinologist by background. I was first at NIH and then went to FDA ultimately to be the senior endocrinologist in the agency. After leaving FDA, I founded a company called Connexum, and it has been doing well as a resource, typically for small companies, but we'll get back to that in a moment. We've been very fortunate that Thomas Sir joined us four years ago to become CEO, a job which I failed at at a certain level, and I was glad to get help. And so Thomas also lives in the region. He brings a great background, very complimentary to mine. And so, Thomas, why don't you say a few things about yourself? Thank you, Zan, and thank you, Rich, for having us on this program. So I guess I typically introduce myself first as a recovering lawyer, But I got into the life sciences space several decades ago. I was on the legal side, general counsel of ICN Pharmaceuticals in Costa Mesa, California. Then I came out to this region, broadly speaking, Baltimore, where I was with Guilford Pharmaceuticals, a NASDAQ-listed company with close ties to Johns Hopkins. I started out as the general counsel, and I moved to the business side. And after that, I went to run a company, a venture-backed company in Strasbourg, France, and moved back here to the area. So I have ties to the region. I'm living in Northern Virginia. Zan and I met a couple years ago after I wrote a uh, LinkedIn article on the application of lean principles to life science companies. He was complimentary. We got to talking and he was kind of complaining about not having the bandwidth to build the Connexum institution. I mean, I shouldn't say that. Clients kept coming in the door and there was just too many things to be done. And so we're working together to see whether we can build on what he has grown here over a decade and a half. Generally, with all partnerships, there's something that's complementary between the two partners. And Zan, what do you see as it that is your strength? And Thomas, what do you see as it that you bring to the table that really makes this a great team? Well, I think you can understand that I bring a clinical background and also a regulatory background that is of value to the clients that we serve. I also aspire to make Connexum more than just a way to serve a narrow purpose, but to punch well above its weight and impact in facilitating the development of health products of every kind. That ranges from standard therapeutic products, drugs, large molecules, complex therapies, digital devices, digital technology, and so on. And so that's a big appetite. That's always been my problem, a big appetite and plenty of clients. Thomas, on the other hand, comes in also a visionary, but in a way that helps to make us meet the rubber to the road. And so that's what I think Thomas is particularly good at doing. I can say something Zan can't. He's a regulatory rock star. Okay, Back in the day in, at the FDA, he led the medical reviews that resulted in the approval of the first statin. 
the first PPAR agonist. The Thank first you, as I take my statins <laughs> every day. <laughs> Insulin analog. And he also was part of the review that approved metformin, which is one of the most widely used diabetes drugs today. So Zan has done his part to uh, contribute to the pharmacopoeia. And so obviously he's an uh, expert in the area. And so he brings that expertise to Connexum. I think what I bring is that I've been on the operating side, and maybe this is not so polite, but I've hired and fired hundreds of consultants. So I think I know, I understand what people people are looking for, particularly the large slice of the pie of our revenue stream and our work stream, which is emerging companies and companies from overseas. I think I bring that perspective in how we're not looking at just a sort of a Delphic oracle to say, this is what the FDA will say, but we'll say, what are you trying to do and why are you trying to do that? And try to partner the uh, client in uh, achieving their corporate objectives, not just their regulatory objectives. I understand sort of the Mr. Inside, Mr. Outside. Someone has to have the vision, but someone has to implement and that Zan is the visionary. You also have vision, Thomas, but somebody actually has to put it into operation, what you're talking about. So we've been talking around about what Connexum really is with companies and products and services and your clients. But Zan, why don't you tell us a little bit about what Connexum really does? Right, Rich. Well, I'll tell you that Connexum is not a typical CRO. It's not even the typical firm where people punch a time clock. But we are powered by highly experienced people that come either from industry, FDA, or other relevant places and can work where they are in a way that's sufficient and highly productive. And that has been our business model. So we're not physically located in one particular place at the moment. That may change. We know it'll be in the BioHealth Capital Region when you make that decision. we got to be close to the FDA. Because we both are. So, and, and you we, have to be close to the FDA, right? And we work with a lot of partners, like Emmis, for example, down the street, one of my uh, favorite CROs. And Lindblad, the president, yes, on my board. I heard that. And Anne's coming to our conference, which we can talk about in a little bit. We'll come back to that in a moment. But the point is, we love radiating from this very point in Rockville and our geography is essentially the whole world because we have folks in China, in Europe, and of course in the U.S. who serve as experts. And we're able to put that mix together in a way that serves clients' needs. And Thomas, you're going to tell me what a typical client looks like and a typical service you would provide to them. Sure. So back to first principles, we are a strategic advisory firm, and we advise on regulatory, clinical, CMC, other translational aspects of life science product development. Most of our clients, by number, tend to be emerging companies. We do have large companies. Uh, Zan serves on various SABs and editorial boards and so forth. We have senior consultants who do that kind of work. But We tend to really like tricky negotiations with or submissions to the FDA, coming up with regulatory clinical strategy. We do more of the design than the execution of it. We'll even do salvage or rescue when people come to us with problems in their regulatory or clinical development. We do due diligence for the money folks, making regulatory claims, I guess, uh, judgments about what may happen in the future, sort of an arbitrage function. So those are things that we do. And basically, when you look at all of these large players you compete with, even though you might have a unique niche, how would you say you're really different from all of the major large CEROs around the world and the country, and what differentiates you from them? Well, I would say that we, of course, by being relatively small, can provide the kind of attention and bandwidth that the large organizations typically cannot do consistently. It's not to say that they don't do good jobs, but we aim to fill a particular niche, and I think we do it exceedingly well. And what I found since Thomas has joined us is that we have this added dimension of contributing to business strategy or commercialization strategy. When Thomas is on the phone, I feel like there's additional value added because he can engage the business side of the company in terms of, have you thought what you're really trying to achieve here with this particular program? And how are you going to fund it? He's able to take it a step further than I typically would in looking at regulatory and pure clinical development strategy. Understood. I think that I met Thomas first at probably our BioHealth Capital Regional Forum. And when he mentioned Connexum, he immediately went into this discussion about metabesity. 
and about this major conference coming up. And I said, what the heck's metabesity? But I think it would be good for our listeners to know and to refresh our listeners. I'm talking to Zan Fleming, who's the chairman of Connexum, and Thomas Sir, who is the president and CEO of Connexum. Thomas, why don't you start and talk with your definition of metabesity? Actually, I'm going to defer to Zan because he is the neologian or neologist, whatever. Oh, he, okay. He's a great coiner of terms, and metabesity is a term that Zan coined, I would say, some years ago, Zan. And it's always good to defer to the chairman. <laughs> well, not he's also necessarily. The, he made up the term. He right. knows what he's talking about. Coming back to the previous question, Rich, I think metabesity is a good example that differentiates our firm and that we are not out just to provide typical services to clients. We really want to make a difference in the ecology of therapeutic development. And that runs the gamut from basic research to clinical development, regulatory, and importantly, commercialization. And we do that, as mentioned, across multiple therapeutic areas and multiple modalities, ranging from nutritional products to standard drugs on to devices and digital technology. Now, metabesity is the culmination of our interest in doing something big. We call it a moonshot because we are approaching the prevention of major chronic diseases and modifying the aging process itself. And that's what metabesity is about. That term refers to the major chronic diseases, cardiovascular and neurologic degenerative disease, diabetes, obesity, cardiovascular disease, and cancer, the aging process itself. All of these have metabolic roots and to some extent are interrelated because of these roots. And therefore, some of the solutions may hit across multiple conditions. So metabesity is putting a name on a constellation of disorders that plague our race, and we would like to do something about it, not just treating disease, but preventing disease and modifying the aging process. So metabesity is a start. The conference is just one example of how we are approaching this target. And the conference itself exemplifies what we think is going to be so important. It's multidisciplinary, not just science and regulatory, but a full range of the other important players that include business, economist, even... We had a theologian or an ethicist, bioethicist, at our inaugural Congress in London in 2017. This is the second edition, and we'll have representatives of established companies, hot emerging companies, uh, capital markets. It's the various stakeholders, and it's that breadth of diversity of uh, cross-disciplinary talk, I think, that makes the conference really unique. We like to make conferences, sort of Steven Spielberg, the filmmaker, at one point said he wanted to make movies he wanted to watch. Well, we want to put on conferences we want to attend and learn from, and that we think that we're approaching that with Metabesity. And before we get into the actual date and location and goals of the conference, when did you come up with the term Metabesity? Well, it's been about eight years now, I think, and it's slowly caught on. It's not a household term yet, and no big deal if it doesn't in itself become a commonly used term. But I do think the concept is fundamentally important. That is, that we should put more effort at every level from our federal government down to local government administration in dealing with some of the root causes of chronic diseases. The solutions are not just standard drugs or nutritional products. It can mean dealing with loneliness, which is a driver of metabolic disease. And in turn, metabolic disease can be a vicious cycle with loneliness in contributing to the exacerbation of chronic diseases. So it's a very complex and daunting target But we think that it can be approached. And the conference that we had back in London in 2017 and the one that is coming up October 15th and 16th in Washington at the Carnegie Institute for Science is a good start. And maybe Thomas could talk about a couple of other facets of metabesity, including our approach to even the Hill. 
specifically on that topic, we are partnering with a media partner, the Aging Analytics Agency, and they are producing and releasing a report, Metabesity and Longevity, in conjunction with our conference. We're part of a group that we're seeking legislation modeled on the Orphan Drug Act for the promotion of developments, uh, intervention, development of interventions, whether they're drugs, devices, or otherwise, that can help achieve healthy longevity. The idea is that currently we have a trap where we go through heroic efforts, research and development, and then medical care to beat the cardiovascular event, the heart attack. And then a couple of years later, the patient succumbs to cancer. Or if they beat, they go through heroic steps to beat the cancer, they're going to have Alzheimer's. So the net gain is, it's nice that the progress is being made, but we think that there's another way to look at things that can also help, which would be to look at delaying biological aging and some of the metabolic disorders, dysregulation, et cetera. There are other hallmarks of aging. So we are not exactly like, but we are members of the same tribe as the people who are working in Jerusalem science at different approaches, senescence and epigenetics and stem cells and telomeres and so forth. We are part of that crowd of folks who are looking for seeing whether we can turn most people, not patients, but would-be non-patients into the super centenarians who can uh, live a healthy long life. And then if they have to go through any period of ill health, it's very compressed. And otherwise, people pass away gracefully in their sleeps. That's kind of an ideal of where we'd like to go. There are other folks who are out there who are looking at ways to extend human lifespan by centuries or millennia. Uh, God bless them. Go for it. Love to read their research, but that's not what we're doing. We're doing things that are on the, where the rubber meets the road, as Zan said. Issues like if you show up at the FDA today and say, we have pills for aging, they don't know what to do with that. But one of our pro bono activities was uh, advising a clinical trial called the TAME trial, the Targeting Aging with Metformin trial, where they negotiated an innovative primary endpoint of a composite of various conditions of aging. That if we can put it off some, some years, there's a certain functional uh, anti-aging claim aspect to it. So we're working on solving these issues. What happens with reimbursement? Why would a payer pay for some an intervention today that won't pay off, so to speak, for decades until the insured party is covered by somebody else? Clinical trials to demonstrate prevention. You're going to need trials that could, I don't know, 100,000 or a million people, 10 years. No one's going to pay for that kind of trial. But we think that with experts coming together to, to identify those issues, we can think of smart ways to solve them. Well, you're helping me understand MetaBC a little better right now. But Generally, when you come up with a new term or a new brand, it takes a visionary, Zan, like you have become. But when you're a pioneer, sometimes trying to sell something as a pioneer is a lot harder when you're following the crowd with trying to improve upon something. So you were the pioneer. You had your first conference in 2017, but this has been around eight years now And what you're trying to be the disciple of this gospel. Who were the early adopters who believed in what your vision was that have helped progress this initiative to where you are today? Well, we do have partners in this quest, and it's been very gratifying to see them come together. For example, the American Federation for Aging Research is a very important partner and a sponsor of our organization, and we have a number of others that are co-sponsors of this particular meeting. And we are working together on other initiatives, like the one that Thomas mentioned, the program to develop a legislation that could ultimately facilitate the development of products that could promote healthy aging. By the way, this is not pie in the sky. We've tried to give you a sense that we're doing things that have tangibility. And one example is that we're not going for the long life span of a, several hundred years. We are trying to focus around the concept of health span, that is, the period of life free of chronic diseases. This is a really practical regulatory endpoint. You can define it very easily, it has face validity. And so this is the kind of thing that we are pushing forward for FDA and other major regulators to consider when they are presented with a product that may forestall the development of chronic disease. It may be only by a matter of months or a few years, but if we can do that across multiple components of metabesity, that is heart disease, cancer, diabetes, dementia, infirmity of aging, then 
that's going to be worth a lot. That's an important, practical first step. It won't be the last step that humankind is capable of taking. And how do you view everything that's going on around DNA testing right now and how it relates to metabesity? Is it complementary or is it contradictory to what you're doing? No, it's certainly an important tool. And that is one tool that will be represented in our conference. Artificial intelligence or machine learning is a a very hot subject today. And that allows us to take genetic information and to make all kinds of values from it. And so that ranges from knowing where you might have originated from geographically. But we would like to put AI, artificial intelligence, to work in helping to develop interventions that can actually improve health span. That's a very important tool for doing so. And we have, for example, a speaker who's an expert in the application of AI for drug development. We're going to ask him to focus on clinical development on the panel that we've asked him to serve on. I know that they have a division that's working very hard on biomarkers of aging. How do you tell that you're getting older, not just someone reporting how old they are, how many birthdays they've had? Obviously, everybody recognizes that we have biological aging that may or may not coincide with our chronological age. That's going to be helpful in learning about the process of aging. Then the question in terms of translation is how do we get the regulatory agencies to agree that they're validated so they can help in the approval of interventions. Those are the kinds of practical problems that we'll be addressing. I do think, Zan, it's a good time to, if you don't mind, we have a stellar roster. I was just going to ask about some of the speakers you're going to have at this conference. So we have a couple of directors of the National Institutes. We have Richard Hodes, who is the director of the National Institute on Aging. Mm-hmm. He's a keynote speaker. We have Gary Gibbons, who's a director of the National Heart, Lung, and, Lung, and Blood, Blood Institute. Thank you very much. We have the director of the CEDAR, a Center for Drug Evaluation Research, Janet Wood, Dr. Woodcock. We have her counterpart on the food side, Center for Food Safety and Applied Nutrition, Dr. Susan Main. And we have representatives. We actually have top researchers and clinicians in fields of geroscience, diabetes, cancer, neurology, et cetera. We have a nutrition panel and a, an exercise panel. We have Dr. Uh, Ken Cooper, who's the father of uh, aerobics, Cooper. aerobics and sure. the Cooper Institute. Exactly. I tracked all my points in my mouth in his little <laughs> book that uh, about 40 years ago. Probably. And he'll uh, present data that suggests that after half a century of uh, following 10,000 or five figures of patients, it seems to be like a gain of uh, like a decade in longevity. I mean, it's not hard, rigorous, clin- prospective, blinded, <laughs> controlled trial, but it's something that I think we're all very, very interested in. Well, this is pretty exciting. You know, there's an interesting thing as I listen, there's almost a parallel to what we did when we came up with the brand BioHealth eight years ago. Coincidental with your eight years ago with Metabesity, but we saw that it's not just about biotechnology or pharmaceuticals. It's basically the convergence of all of the different disciplines, technologies, pharma, biomarkers, tools, vaccines, and everything that comes together that can help with health span and aging. And I see that the biohealth term is very similar to what you're doing with metabesity. And I didn't draw that corollary when you first mentioned it to me. But when I listen to what you're talking about, all of those different disciplines coming together at your conference, as well as as they feed into the papers you're writing and the research that will be done, is very analogous to what we're doing with biohealth. I think you're going to see waving arms and saying it's all one story is easy to say, but the actual practical benefits of people, experts in the room from various disciplines getting together and exchanging ideas is really exciting part of the the, 27, the London conference. If I can just finish, the listeners at this point might think that we have scientists and we, we have some regulators, we have some people from NIH, but we're also going to have representatives from established companies. That's important because if industry is not engaged at the beginning, it's hard to bring them in at the end. So we have the CMO of Novo Nordisk. We have the... Uh, U.S. VP Diabetes of Sanofi. We have actually the Deputy Chief Scientific Officer of PepsiCo from the nutritional side. We have the CMO of Vivango, which is a social app, sort of a digital health tech giant. Actually, it's grown to be a 10-figure company. We also have uh, hot emerging companies. They're working in AI and nutrition and synthetic and natural uh, peptide discovery and Alzheimer's approaches, both drug-facing and consumer-facing. So they have drug development programs as well as nutritional products that they're selling on the market. So it's a really a fascinating melange of ideas and business models that are emerging. I would be remiss if I didn't ask. I know that you have some NIH representatives, which is extremely important, plus FDA, which are very prominent within the biohealth capital region. But 
Are you seeing any emerging companies in this region that are going to contribute to this topic of metabesity? And have they been invited to participate, or is there a way to still get them invited if they have an interest? Well, absolutely. We want to get local companies involved, and to the extent that they can attend the meeting and be a part of that gathering, we will be delighted We've got a very full program, but we're going to continue to have these conferences over time. And I hope that the region will become a hotbed of metabesity research, development, and commercialization. As you say, Rich, we're talking about multiple technologies. So it really is biohealth, and it's all about making the health of people better with solutions that are achievable, that are affordable and can be put to use on an everyday basis. I like you use the term commercialization a lot because when we talk to scientists and people who are interested, you mentioned publishing papers. If you work at the NIH and you get a paper published or you get a patent issued, that's a success. And that helps you with your tenure, whether it's at an academic institution or in a federal agency like NIH. But you don't hear the term commercialization talked about as much as you are mentioning it here. And so are you going to have in this conference some things focused on commercialization around metabesity? So glad you asked because we have them in spades. We have, for example, Dennis Purcell, who is sort of one of the father figures in biotech investment. And there'll be others with him. So it's very much bringing together the business side, the investor and capital market side, because ultimately that is going to be required. It's not going to reach the patients unless it reaches the market. So. That's right. True. And then your first one was in London. How did that become the first location? And then why is Washington, D.C. the second location? Well, London was sort of the result of play of chance, I, I would have to say. We were asked to put together a conference somewhere in Europe, and this is the conference we came up with. My uh, esteemed colleague and friend, Larry Steinman, who's professor of neurology and immunology at Stanford and a luminary in the therapeutic development world. He has been a terrific partner in putting together this meeting. And we wanted to have an international flavor to the start of our movement. And we had that. We had the analogs of FDA, the payer, NICE, the Pharmacoeconomic Assessment Organization in the UK. We had a European flavor when we got started, but that was that was our first, it was our dry run, and now we've come back to the U.S., and what makes sense for being the ground of our efforts being Washington, D.C. And one of the questions you asked earlier, Rich, was, I mean, before this podcast, I guess, is why Washington? What makes Washington important to this? Well, Capitol Hill, I mean, this is the political policy lawmaking center of the United States, and the United States spends more money per capita than any other country in the world. We actually are, is it number nine or so? We're very low down amongst the developed countries with respect to metrics like HALE, Health Adjusted Life Expectancy, which is the fraction of uh, health span over lifespan, right. compared to other countries like Singapore and UK and Israel and yeah, South yeah. Korea and Japan. That's not an arms race we want to lose. This is a, a benevolent arms race, but we want to prompt the U.S. policymakers and the lawmakers. This is a bipartisan is- issue. It's something that all of of us are very interested in to be able to live long lives that are not filled with sickness at the end of it for ourselves and for our families and caregivers. But it also represents a tremendous trillions of dollars in potential health cost savings. We need to adjust our trajectory so that we can realize these savings in health costs. And in addition, by having many more millions, tens of millions more mentally alert, physically independent, engaged members of our society and our economy. It represents trillions of dollars in potential economic value and opportunity. So it's win, win, win. And we think that we want to become a rush to the front of the line of people who are working on healthy longevity and harvesting the resultant health span dividend. Well, we're glad you're back where you belong in the biohealth capital region. And then the other question some of the listeners might be asking about Zan Fleming, the chairman of Connexum, and Thomas Sir, president and CEO of Connexum, is what's in it for Connexum and holding a conference which is very hard to coordinate, and what do you hope to gain from the conference as well as what is the benefit to a company or a corporation like Connexum? 
Well, Rich, we're not making money from this conference for sure. It's a labor of love. It's a labor of love. We won't talk about the cost of the conference, and but we will lose money. And we're not even thinking of Connexum as a brand and doing this. I think this is out of a genuine impulse to contribute to a higher purpose. And having been in the field for decades and seen efforts directed in various directions without making the kind of impact that we would like to see in the future, that's what gets us up in the morning. We still have to uh, pay the mortgage, and we're able to do that. And we're just glad to contribute this as a pro bono commitment to something good. Can I comment that we're a professional services firm. We're no different in that regard from the McKinsey, Bain, Boston Consulting Group, or law firms. We share three features with every other professional services firm. We want to consistently delight our clients. We want to provide opportunities for professional development for our consultants, and we want to achieve financial success for our firm and our clients. We have a fourth explicit pillar of Connexum's sort of uh, our values. We want to do our part to contribute to the translation arts and to public health. So this is an example of this, the Metabesity movement and the conference. We do other things. We don't need to talk about them now. But so when you say what's in it for us, it's in our DNA that we certainly want to serve paying clients and do well for them. But we also, uh, this is a critical component of who we are as Connexum. Great. It's nice to see this as part of both of your legacy that we'd like to leave here in the United States. And Find ways to help me live longer. <laughs> <laughs> we have a little skin of the game and here, with too. less pain. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about corporate goals and what you see as the future for your conference as well as Connexum. Well, I'm glad to say that Thomas is taking our company to the next level. And this will be doing what we've been doing, but doing more and doing it even better. And I think this will be an important resource for small and large companies in the future. We like our roots here in the capital region. We see that as maybe the most important single region when you consider all the things that we have here, not just government and regulation, but media and wealth. And so I hope that we will be a part of the infrastructure here in the capital region to facilitate therapeutic development of companies that are within even shouting distance. We just came from a company called Rapa Therapeutics. Write that down. It's an exciting company. R-A-P-A? R-A-P-A. Right from Rapa Mycin, Rapa Therapeutics. A very exciting immunology company currently directed with programs in cancer and ALS. And I think this is a company to keep your eye on. Are they in the region? They're, They're 10 minutes drive from here. Oh, good. Okay. They're, they're across from the Park Lawn building where I spent a good part of my career. Great. Okay. Well, I'd appreciate an intro and we'll see what we can learn about that. I think you'd really enjoy talking to them. Great. So the next question would be is for both Connexum and Metabesi, what can an organization like BioHealth Innovation do for you? So certainly you're helping us a lot by getting the word out and publicizing and educating people who are in the field so that they can join, become part of the tribe. Where That's very helpful. Secondly, I would say that we talked about maybe uh, locating in the area, and we talked about sort of intelligent office type of facilities because we are a virtual company, and we have folks in Germany and uh, India and West Coast and up uh, Northeast and so forth. We tend to congregate here for meetings and for staging for meetings at the FDA and so forth. So it'd be great to have the sort of resource that you offer to be able to show us around, if you will, the county and set up a place. I think downstream, I hope that we can certainly keep in touch about what each of us is doing, because I think the thoughts we have about trying to persuade the U.S. to take a leadership role in healthy longevity is, as you say, absolutely part of biohealth, right? It's wonderful that we can develop treatments, but it'd be so much easier if we can prevent and delay diseases and so forth. So you tell me, I, I think that there are lots of ways that we should be able to work together to achieve these uh, goals because they're shared goals. Yeah, I think one of the unfortunate things is October 15th and 16th this year, we're holding a BioHealth Capital Region Investor Conference, which is equally important wow. at AstraZeneca, where we're inviting 100 companies who are looking for capital, and we're inviting 
30 to 40 investors who have capital to do one-on-one meetings. And we're doing this with JP Morgan and Wilson Sonsini and AstraZeneca. So it's an equally important conference to yours, but probably is a different audience than what you're attracting, even though there may be some corollary between the two. So in the future, when you do your third conference, we'll make certain we don't have them on the same dates in the same location. But I think We do a lot of things for international companies who want to land in this region because of the unique assets we have. And you talk about ways we might be able to help you. It's almost like domestic soft landing. What are your needs and what can we do to help you meet those needs as you decide what you want to do when you want to put a stake in the ground somewhere here in this biohealth capital region? And we'd be glad to do that with you. That'd be terrific. I mean, obviously, Connexum itself doesn't do that, but we see a lot of deal flow and clients who are looking to do exactly that. And so lastly, in closing here, Zan and Tom, we're talking to Zan Fleming, who's the chairman of Connexum, and Thomas Sir, who's the president and CEO of Connexum. Let's give the listeners one last pitch on the conference, time, location, date. How do they find out more information? Is there still time to register? Well, thanks very much for that, Rich. There indeed is plenty of time to register, though I hope you'll do it very soon. Conference is on October 15th and 16th. It's in the heart of our nation's capital at the Carnegie Institute for Science. It's a, uh, a conference that I think will be kind of like a Woodstock event, one that people will say, we were there when that happened. And I hope that we'll look back at this conference as being one that really was a landmark event, got people thinking in a way that pulled them together to pull in the right direction. Well, Andy, our producer is big into events in Woodstock. So if you need music for this, he can help put together the music for your your conference we on metabesity. We powered music. <laughs> so I want to thank Thomas and Zan for... Rich, can oh, I mention the, yeah, the website, www.metabesity2019.com, M-E-T-A-B-E-S-I-T-Y. 2019.com. Love to see you there. Okay, very good. We'll make sure that we have that posted with the article we write about both of you in next week's newsletter as well. But Zan and Thomas, thank you for being on Biotalk. We wish you the best of luck with your company and connects them and your pro bono work that you're doing to make greater awareness on longevity through metabesity and the conference you're going to have at the Carnegie Institution Institution for Science Science and Technology on October 15th and 16th in Washington, D.C. Thank you. Thank you, Rich. Thanks, Rich. Thanks for listening to Biotalk with Rich Bendis. 